G'day guys, welcome to the world's most actionable podcast, bar none, actionable. I'm going to kill it, I'm going to keep going. Hey, my name is Isaac Shrek and I host the Noob Story Podcast. It's interviews with spearfishing experts, authorities and characters and trying to tease out their actionable insights, tips and stories that will help us make us all a better Spiros. Today, it's Ben Honky. He lives in or around Tamworth and travels out to sort of the mid New South Wales coast and uh, but what I really like about what Ben's doing, he's a very entrepreneurial fella. He he um, sells spice rubs, um, perfect for any type of hunting, including seafood. Um, so check that out at honkyoutdoors.com. It's H O H N K E outdoors.com. Um, he's got a great YouTube channel, fantastic Instagram, uh, very much a, a Spiro dad and a hunting and foraging dad too. And the whole family's in on the bizzo. So it's really cool. Love this interview. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Um, we've got a couple of good ones coming at you this year in 2023. I'm really enjoying some of the people I've had on the podcast this year already. Uh, Wally Garley and Robbie Peck, fantastic interviews. And uh, a couple of insights from uh, Old Man Blue, Bert Calder here, about the sort of the first two interviews of the year. Have a listen. Hey, Shrek. Bert here from Old Man Blue. Mate, what a top um, interview that was with Robbie. Yeah, and his whole experience of his bull shark attack is pretty vicious. And, um, yeah, I think we all think of it all the time ourselves. Um, he had just a story about, you know, his mates looking after him, level-headed. It definitely did help. Um, and also I really like the part where he said about his son being on board Um both keeping him calm, but yeah, I suppose it's funny how these bad things happen, but good things happen while, you know, it's good that his son was there to give him sort of support and reason to pull through. Um, and also how he took the Toriki off the boat, that's pretty horrible. But um, how they improvised with a weight belt, that was pretty smart. Um, yeah. And also the, the part where he said about the dogs, I agree with that 100%. Um, sharks are just like dogs, I always said that myself. Um, and uh, what he said about a Labrador, not all of them are friendly. There will be a Labrador that can bite. Um, something that I would like to add in there is, in my experience, the times that I've had with sharks, find the most aggressive shark and only concentrate on that and show that you are the alpha. Keep it alpha and try and just pretend you are at least, um, and that will give you a chance as well. And I'm um, really looking forward to your interview with Wally, another guy from Port Edland. Um both Mika and Antoine that I dive with all the time, they um, both speak quite highly of him and said what a character. And um, it be interesting to hear some stories of his homeland as well. Um, and I wonder about the Durban knot. I hope you covered that one. Anyway, mate, have a good one and um, looking forward to listening to the next podcast. Bye. Some great points and takeaways there from the interviews from Bert there. Uh, check him out, Old Man Blue on Instagram. Uh, I love what he's doing over there in WA with innovative equipment, some of the best crayfishing gear, lobster gear on the planet. Um, if you want to leave a voice message, go to noobspirit.com, head up into the menu there and leave me a voice message. Tell me about your latest and greatest new bit of equipment. Tell me about something scary that happened to you and your mates and what you learned from it. Uh, tell me about an episode you loved or a review for 99 Spiro recipes. I would love all of that. Go to noobspiro.com and leave me leave me some love. All right, quick couple of quick shout outs. The 2023 World Freshwater Spearfishing Tournament is being hosted by the National Freshwater Spearfishing Association. Find out about it at freshwaterworlds.com. It's going to be held at Lake Powell in Page, Arizona from May 16th to 20th. It's a fantastic opportunity to meet a bunch of mad Spiros, mad keen Spiros from all over the planet. If you've never competed, it's probably a really good competition to jump in on. And uh, check it out, Lake Powell, awesome destination. Guys like Justin Lee, uh, I've heard his feedback about this tournament and he absolutely loves it. High-level Spiros go, but everyday Spiros, just frothers like you and me. Check it out at freshwaterworlds.com. Um, got a couple of reviews for 99 Spiro Recipes, the hardcover. Uh, ben T., Actionable AF. I'm not quite up with AF, so I won't. I won't hazard a guess as to what that means. Um, easy, delicious recipes for everyday cooking. We knew this book would be good, but its quality definitely exceeded our expectations. Well done to Shrek and his community of Spiros for putting this culinary gem together. Thanks for the review, Ben. Um, if you want to get a copy, go to noobspiro.com. Um, and, and grab yourself a copy. David also left a review for it. He says, 99 recipes, you can really do that with fish. I used to give away my green lip abalone to mates. Abalone schnitzel is a thing. 
Looks like I'm keeping them from now on. High quality printing as the photos just look insane. Recipes to die for. It makes you get hangry just looking at them. Legit recommend this book from the bottom of my soul. Um, reviews like that go a long way, David. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, if you are looking to buy a copy of 99 Spare Recipes in store, then check out any of these stores which should be in your area. If they're not, Tell your spearfishing retailer to get hold of me, Shrek at namespearrow.com, and I'll get them in store wherever you live. But here are a list of the stores that are holding 99 Spear recipes right now. Spearfishing Superstore up in Cairns, Spear West in Perth, Boss Outdoor Marimbula, um, Fergo's Tackle World in Wollongong, Batavia Coast Dive and Water, Sto- uh, Water Sports in Geraldton. Uh, we've got Adreno Aspley in the north side, Brisbane north side, Adreno Woolongabba on the south side, Adreno Gold Coast, Adreno Melbourne, Adreno Sydney, and Adreno Perth. Any of those stores are carrying 99 Spare Recipes. Head in there, grab yourself a copy if you don't have one already. Otherwise, if you want to buy one online, come to noobspare.com and uh, get yourself a copy. Hey, lots of promo there for the book today. Uh, I, want to, I want to get these things moving out into our community. We've put a hell of a lot of effort into them. It was crowdfunded, and I want to get it out there. I know you guys share my passion. Um, but hey, let's not muck around. Ben Honky from Honky Outdoors. Here we go. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out, and if you want to buy gear, Pump in the code NOOBSPIRO to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NOOBSPIRO, save some cash, and support the NOOBSPIRO podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it, and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. Hey guys, not sure how you stay hydrated out on the boats on those long days out on the water. Uh, but staying hydrated is absolutely critical to gourds. Good equalization and looking after your body, making sure you're not doing those awkward one-legged kicks to the surface when, when one leg cramps out on you. Go to aqualite.com.au and get yourself a box of sachets. You just simply add them to water. It's less than $1.28 per serve, cheaper and healthier than any other sports drinks on the market. Aqualite will make a difference in your spearfishing. Check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSparrow to save 10% on any order. Check it out. Aqualite, made in Western Australia. G'day, NoobSparrow community. Uh, welcome to the show. Today it's uh, Ben Honky from Honky Outdoors. Ben's been a listener of the show for a long time, but he's also got a, a bunch of recipes in 99 Spare Recipes. And uh, Ben and I have interacted in a multitude of ways over the years. Um, he's only been spearing a couple of years, but I think, have you been in, into Noob Spiro since you started? Or uh, Yeah, so I, I jumped straight into listening to Noob Spiro right as I kicked off my journey. Uh, a few people in different Facebook groups sort of recommended the podcast and I sort of started listening to it while I was driving to work and going to the gym in the morning and I haven't stopped since, so... Yeah. You're a motivated fella. You must listen to a few podcasts. Like, so I'll just give people a quick overview from my understanding. So, you're a father, a hunter, a forager, a Spiro. You work full time. You do all of this and you're very entrepreneurial as well. You've got a bunch of like outdoors rubs and spices up. People can check it out on Honky Outdoors. I really want to ask you about your last name. So, just for people, for spelling wise, <laughs> it's H O H N. K-E, Honky Outdoors. It's a very unusual name. Where does it come from, Ben? Yeah, um, so it's from a little region that's sort of if you slice nearly the border of Poland and Germany. And it was, it's was it been both Poland and Germany, depending on which part of history you sort of go back to. So that's where the name's from. And I unfortunately don't have a lot of contact with, you know, anyone from the home country or anything like that, I think. A lot of them 
sort of fled here. And the poles have been kicked yeah. around, haven't they? I was in uh, Warsaw yeah. like maybe four or five years ago, and I went and did Auschwitz and had a good look around that little part of Poland. Very interesting and different part of the world. Like one side of it is like very much uh, Russian. Everyone speaks Russian, and even culturally, they're very similar to the Russians. But then a large part of the Polish really resent Russians and. It's a it's a crazy part of the world. Has that affected your worldview, being of that sort of heritage? Um, not really. I I just sort of feel very Australian, I guess. <laughs> like it's sort of yeah. I just this is where we are, and yep. this is the culture, and I'm just trying to make the most of where I am. I guess I was going to make my same old joke. When I meet other immigrants here from whatever country, I always tell them, um, you know, like you Polish coming to Australia and taking Kiwi jobs. Um, <laughs> to go down pretty well. Um, okay, so you, you, you've you grown up, have you grown up always in New South Wales? And uh, which part of the New South Wales sort of coast do you, do you have good access to? Yeah, so um, I was born in this little small country town called Corindai, which is about three hours from the nearest ocean. I uh, sort of went to high school there and later have moved to Tamworth when I finished school, which is a regional city with about a, a population of around 60,000. Uh, and I haven't left town at all. Like this is <laughs> sort of where I've been. Like we'll do holidays to the coast like since I was a kid. But, um, yeah, so we've got access to essentially anywhere from the Hunter to the mid-north coast to anywhere from sort of Newcastle to Coffs Harbour is within three and a half to five hours drive from here. So when you go on a spearing mission, do you try and make it a multi-day affair? Yeah, I generally try and make it, normally try and get at least a two-night sort of trip in. That way it's like you've got a day, you can travel, have a spear, have a camp, stay overnight, full day of spearing the next day. Then if conditions are good, have a quick spear on, say, the Sunday and then drive back home that afternoon. Yeah, cool. Right, so I mentioned earlier, you're like, you've only been spearing a couple of years. How long ago did it start? It was 2019, I'm thinking? Uh, 2020. Okay. So when, when you know, the world turned on its head and went nuts and was sort of, sort of found myself at home a little bit more than I was at work and ended up. I sort of, I sort, yeah, it's sort of one of those things you sort of get a seed can sort of be planted like early in your life. You'll see something and then you'll sort of think about it and it sort of grows and then eventually someone comes and cuts the tree down and turns it into a proper idea of, <laughs> hey, you should turn around and do this. So that was one of those things. So What was the seed then? I remember when what I was. What was the spearfishing seed? So when I was a kid, we were on a holiday at a little coastal town called Crescent Head on the mid-north coast, mm. and um, we'd been out fishing off the beach that morning, you know, caught some brim, some whiting, some dart, the usual sort of surf species, and we are at the boat ramp cleaning them up, and this guy pulls up in a little white Hyundai XL, like, you know, the old-style one, yep. and he uh, pops the boot on it, and he's got a massive orange-like ice chest esky in there. And it's just got this fish in there that's so big, the <laughs> tail's like hanging out one end of it. And it took up the whole boot space of this car, like, so it's a proper thing. And he just pulls this massive mull away out of it, this guy in this black wetsuit. And I'm like, how'd, how'd you get that? And he's like, oh, I speared it. And I'm like, oh, where'd you get it? Because when you're a kid, you're shameless in asking people where they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they got stuff. So and he sort of told me the spot. And then I said to Dad, oh, we should go fishing there this afternoon and see if we can catch one. And he's like, you can't fish there. Like, it's pretty much impossible to get a line out to this spot. Like, you, it involves a swim out and then around this headland mm. and there's nowhere to safely fish it at all. Mm. So that was sort of the seed. Uh, a mate of my best mate from high school, turns out he was born on the same day as me, but we never met till high school. All right. And when he left school, he moved down to the Hunter and one of his mates was into spearfishing. So he got roped into it and we'd grown up bow hunting and fishing together and 
every time I caught up with him, like, oh, yeah, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, yeah, just being out spearfishing and, you know, it's awesome, you know, chasing these fish around. And and I was pretty keen, but I was also pretty broke at the time and working sort of casual jobs. So I sort of put it on the back burner for a while. And, um, and also I've always been a little bit of afraid of the ocean. don't know if that's ever come across, but terrified of the thought of sharks and always had this idea that in every little rock pool there's a blue ring Dr. Push ready to come out and just latch on to your hand and give you a heart attack and kill you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I've had to work through all that. But, um, yeah, so 2020 hit and I was watching some YouTube and I saw something and then it just happened to be a related video and it was something like Spearfish in New South Wales and pretty sure it was a wet mammal video. Yeah. Seeing, seeing Clothier. Yeah. And anyways, I remember just putting that video on and it's just one of his, you know, classic montage videos. Yeah. And, you know, just watching him, you know, swim around in all that kelpy underwater environment and I'm going, oh, you, is this really what, you know, the ocean looks like under the surface, mm. like, you know, in my state, not far from where I live? And then I was sort of pretty hooked on that. And I did sort of... I watched the videos, but I didn't let the idea grow for a bit. Mm. And then I came across the one of those meat eater episodes where he's up in Alaska. Oh, yeah. He's diving Harvesting the sea cucumber. sea cucumbers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Harvesting the sea cucumbers. And then I think that was it. That was when the tree Steve, of this idea Steve, got felled. Steve Rinella and Giannis Patelis, I think, that one. I, I think I remember watching yeah. the same – the same episode and just frothing on it. And then all they were doing was yeah. harvesting sea cucumbers. So that that's yeah. an inspirational video. Yeah. And I remember just watching that and just that, it's just that well-rounded outdoorsman mentality, which is sort of what I've always tried to be, which is why I'm so you know, the hunting, the fishing, fly fishing, foraging for mushrooms, foraging for wild foods. And then it's sort of like you see this whole other facet that you've ignored and you're like, I'm missing this whole chunk of my well-roundedness and you're like, <laughs> I have to give this a go. And I think a couple of months after that, I got a, a nice little tax return and sort of spoke to Sarah about it and said, oh, you know, um, I might, I think I'll buy a wetsuit and some fins. I've already got a like a snorkel mask, which was crap and I had to pretty much throw out immediately. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I had that and just sort of had the idea of, you know, I'll get into it and I'll learn how to chase things like urchins and abalone and lobsters. That idea only didn't even last until I got to the water by the time I um, went to the coast for the first expedition out of getting out of lockdown. I'd already picked up a like a 110 single band gun and, <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and some other things and, yeah, so... Yeah, <laughs> that, that that feeling like that you that you just communicated that when you latch on to spearfishing as a lifestyle and then you have that romantic idea in your head like like I liked your analogy the the seed was planted and then you know like maybe a decade or two decades later the tree was cut down um, that that's beautiful and then spending the money while it's painful because you don't have a lot even your family man and you know I don't know what your position was in but I I can definitely relate. So buying that first spearfishing gear, it's um you, you're trying to hold back and be disciplined, but then you're you're full of froth and eager to get in and get amongst it. Um, did yeah. did you find that it was easy to spend money? Did you spend money on the right things, on the wrong things? How was that journey on a tight budget? Um, I sort of knew I was running a line, like I because I've been into so many of these sort of similar hobbies. I know that, you know, you do get what you pay for a lot. And if I bought too cheap, I was just going to be buying it again mm. fairly soon. And if I bought too expensive, I'd be saving for the next three years before I could Go spear for sure. even think about jumping in. So I sort of had to find a line between going, here's my budget. What's the best I can get out of this? Mm. And then just buying the bullet and getting it. And I'm still... I've still got the wetsuit I bought then. It's just a three mil, like one piece steamer suit. It's nothing flash, but I spoke to someone else and he said, just keep it because he's 
Like even if you just use it for going getting lobsters mm. later on, and that way you don't get your good wetsuit stuffed up, getting smashed over bombies and yeah, true, true, different things like that. So mm. um, the gun I had for a while, I got a new gun for Christmas last year. What'd you get? Uh, I got. Him. Oh, he's got it behind him. And yeah, aim yeah. right. Uh, Vendetta roller, oh, five. How's that go? So. Uh, I haven't actually fired it in the water yet. Oh. So, <laughs> That's, that was a whole Christmas ago, Ben. you got to get in and get amongst it, buddy. Yeah, I've, I've had it out three times. Oh, yeah. And um, lucked out. The first time, sort of, yeah, the first time I wasn't having a great day. I, um, I'd actually been down the Hunter for work, and it just so happened that um, fellow listener of this show, um, and I think he's got a recipe in 99 Spiros, Aaron Kiggins. Yeah, yeah. He was, yeah, Aaron's got a recipe. He it. was yeah. having a holiday, like right where I was working, and I sort of messaged him and we met up the next day. But it was just that first week back after New Year's, and it was stinking hot. Like it was nearly 40 degrees over on the coast yeah. and humid, and that was pretty dehydrated, and the water was. Like rubbish visibility. It was just murky filth. I and... love those days. <laughs> you feel yeah. like crap in your so, body and the water conditions are crap. That's a recipe for not shooting fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that ended up um, ended up me swimming around, getting a leg cramp, having a spew in the water, <laughs> <laughs> eventually pulling the pit on it. So uh, I didn't even – I don't even think I loaded the gun that day. I just followed Aaron around. He meets the plug like a, a ludric and a, a drummer. Nice. Uh, which he just told me to take home because he already had something sorted for dinner that night, So, cool. which was good. But, um, yeah, and then the other times I've been out – actually, no, I've only been out one other time since then, and that was in my second last YouTube video, this video where I take um, James, my seven-year-old son, out spearfishing. Mm. So we were just snorkeling around in a sort of shallow, sheltered spot and – I only saw one fish worth spearing, which was a luderick. It just sort of kept coming out front on from behind a rock, facing me like this, yeah. and then gump on the rock. And yeah, I couldn't couldn't get a good angle on it. So yeah, I haven't haven't fired the gun unfortunately yet, but hoping to change that in the next couple of weeks. Do you have a swimming pool? Do you do any training? How do you how do you stay fit so you can make the most of it when you're out there? I know I know a lot of that sort of coastal New South Wales diving, like you don't need to be a hectic diver or anything like that, but it still helps if you can get 45 seconds in a dive and then, you know, drop down and, you know, your, your fitting technique doesn't feel like you're, you know, like a friggin' um, an elephant trying to, you know, keep up with, I don't know, like, do you know what I mean? Like do something that's completely unnatural yeah. to you anyway. Yeah, so one of my biggest things when I got back to, you know, being sort of scared of the ocean, I'm not the best swimmer in the world. And that's sort of, I think I um, came third place in backstroke in primary school. <laughs> but was like three kids in the race. So um, that's my um, swimming expertise. And so. Hang on, hang on a sec. I, I, did of, the, I did the intro to the podcast wrong. Uh, g'day, Noob Spiro community. Today I've got regional New South Wales third place primary school backstroker, Ben Honky. Hey, Shrek, how are you doing? <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, okay. So so you, you're not that confident in the water and yet you're swimming out through sometimes hectic swell, like the that, you know, any, yeah. any part of that coastline you identified, most of the good spots are subject to hectic swell and, and bad conditions. Yeah. So how do you find that? Right. So we we'll just just backtrack a bit. Mm. So after I got this idea, got the wetsuit, got a set of they're a set of plastic like pelagic fins. So they're a nice long plastic fin. They're not not terrible. I could still be using them now. I end up selling them on to my brother, my older brother who's gotten into it now as well. Um, as soon as those fins sort of showed up, I signed back up to the local 360 gym here in Tamworth, which has a 25 metre ah, indoor pool. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So there's our year round sort of training solution. So I just made it so that every, I think every three times a week, I'd pack the fins and the snorkel and go for a swim before work and just alternate it between like weight training days at the gym. Mm. 
sort of thing. And yeah, I just more just to get comfortable with finning and I just sort of swim for as long as I could and then even just, you know, try to hold my breath, go down the bottom and do a lap or something like that, which wasn't easy to begin with at all. So were you training with yeah, someone? Was, I hope so. Uh, I hope so. I know you'd hope so, but no. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if but you're listening, if doing, you're listening, yeah. please train with other people in the swimming pool. Like I love taking yeah. like new freedivers and spiros to the pool. And the worst thing that you can do is have a blackout or a samba in a swimming pool because then none of us can go and do it again because you know you if you're in a controlled environment, a lifeguard's probably pulled you out or whatever. But I tell you what, it ruins it for the rest of us. So don't be like men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do what I did. I actually haven't done it for oh, quite it. a while, yeah. and I, yeah, I like the, the I like um, the backtracking there. Yeah, yeah, there is sort of a lifeguard normally there, and when I was doing it in the mornings before work, there was often like a whole swim school in every lane beside you. There was only one lane open to the public oh, type yeah. thing. So yeah, there's people around, but yeah, really should. Um, team up with people to do it, which is probably why I haven't done any pool training for yeah. a little bit now. This is the thing, like yeah. it's you, you, it's hard to find and build community around you. Sometimes, I mean, you're three hours inland trying to find another person that shares the same passion as you and the same discipline that will actually show up and do the training with you. It's a, it's a hard thing, so I'm not, I'm not dismissing that. And like, if you did, if you were conservative and you were, you know, just doing 25 meters or something, and you kind of had an arrangement with the lifeguard. You know, I mean, these are some ways you could sort of work work around, but I mean, that's yeah, it's just it's not ideal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there is actually there's one other person I know that lives in Tamworth that spearfishes as well, and he'll take his teenage sons over to foster fairly regularly and go for a dive. But we were the first time I went spearfishing was actually meant to be with him. We were going to go to foster, and then the weekend it was all we were planning to go there, um, they called up the day before because there'd been a northeaster coming in for like a week and a half and the dive shop at Foster said, don't even bother, the, the viz is like less than a metre. Uh. So, but I'd sort of already made plans to get away for the weekend <laughs> and the car was already packed and I sort of did a lot of last minute running around, made some phone calls and got into the dive shop in Nelson Bay um and they said that's for the south uh yeah that's just probably i don't know how long it takes you to get there from foster but it's probably an hour and a half south yep from there but yeah it takes me the same amount of time to go to either or place okay so i called up there and they um said yeah they had um some scuba divers out that morning and the viz was still 10 meters oh, even okay. after the rain so um I tried to convince this other guy to come with me and he already made plans to go down the central coast somewhere. So I was like, yeah, no worries. Um, end up finding a dive buddy very, very last minute, um, which which got me in a little bit of trouble later on because uh, <laughs> Sarah was under the impression that I'd already found someone before <laughs> I went to go down with, whereas I'd found someone about half an hour before I arrived at this spot. So <laughs> I have the same battles, mate. Yeah. I think it's the reality of spearfishing sometimes. And mate, back, you know, a generation ago, everyone dives solo, you know, that's why there's so, so many still old experienced divers and they prefer to dive alone. I, I think I li- I literally think a lot of it is about building like muscle memory. It's like, if you start spearfishing with a buddy, you're going to persist spearfishing with a buddy. If you start solo, you're probably going to prefer and always prefer diving solo. It's a great habit to dive with a buddy because they're your only safety equipment. But the reality is um, sometimes you dive alone. And um, as long as you accept responsibility for it, then I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of personal freedom and the ability to choose. I mean, what's your take on it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in that same and because I had sort of spoke to some people that were spear fishermen. I know and I said, look, if worst case I'm on my own, is there anywhere that's safe to go? You know, and they, a few people actually suggested the same place. Yep. So I said, look, he's sheltered. You're not going to be dealing with swell. It's fairly shallow and you can sort of go up along these 
sort of like bouldery edges, but it's not like it's a vertical drop. So if you swim up and along, go out, say, 100, 200 metres, and then you're not feeling comfortable or whatever, or you're feeling fatigued, you can just cut a beeline across and climb out of the water and walk back. Yeah, nice. So I was like, yeah, so that was where I ended up going, and I've actually been diving there probably more than anywhere else now. It's just been a good little spot to cut my teeth and get into it. Do you like the idea of having a local and then sort of like you can actually figure it out and start tuning it? Because like the problem with having one place you go spearfishing is that place absorbs all the pressure. And if it's a popular spot amongst all the locals, then it absorbs all the pressure from all the locals. It's great to spread our efforts, but there's something about, like you said, cutting your teeth on one spot. You kind of, you work out how the current moves in that area. You work out, you know, where the pressure points are. You, you know, you learn about the good caves and the rock structure. You learn how to triangulate with landmarks. There's a lot of advantages to it. And you, you kind of know where the same schools of stuff are as well, generally, like depending on, you know, what yeah. the variables are in the day. So... What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And that's probably what this sort of spot is. And it is a fairly popular spot because even when I pulled up in the car park there, I could see three other Spiros already in the water at various spots around the bay. Mm-hmm. So, and luckily by the time I was sort of ready to get in, I think there was only one left and he'd moved right out over and across. So I was sort of diving where people had already been all morning because I could watch the floats going up and down yep. from where I was in the car, but uh, I was still finding still finding fish. And, it's yeah, it's interesting, like you say that, because of the probably four times I've dived at this spot, uh, no two times have been the same. Okay. It's been different conditions. I've had the first day I went there was probably the best biz, mm. and then the next couple of times have been – Pretty rubbish fears and a bit windy, choppy. But um, yeah, it's been yeah, it's been interesting to see that you know, like one time you might find a heap of this certain type of fish. Like the first time I went there, there was heaps of luderick and drummer hanging out as the tide hit its high peak. They sort of all moved into these really shallow boulders, like half a meter to a meter tops of water. There was just massive schools of them in there, and I haven't seen that since, even though I've been looking for it. So, yeah. Because they eat, like, conjavoy and stuff like that off the rocks, don't they? And they're sort of in and amongst that, whatever the action is around the, the rocks. They love that sort of that white water and surf, and they don't mind the big Yeah, surge. yeah, and the mm. sea lettuce and different things like that, yeah. Yeah, and they're predominant. That Well, they're just vegetarians, aren't they? So... This is why yeah. a lot of experienced bearers turn their nose up at them. But, I mean, if you gut them and, <laughs> and bleed them in the water, um, you can do a fair bit with them. And they, most of those species all smoke up pretty well. Yeah, I haven't I haven't tried smoking a luderick yet. Um, I think the last one I had actually dry-aged it for about four days in the fridge. Yeah. Just um, got it dry, paper towel, and kept rotating it and, did you learn? Did you learn? And it that, came out. Did you learn that one from the podcast? Me talking about my povo. I dry did. Age? I did learn that from the podcast. Yeah. I heard you talk about it and went, "I'm going to do that with this fish." Mm. And uh, yes, that was what I did. And we just cooked it over charcoal with some some of my salt bay spice oh, rub on it. Nice, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, just flake it all off and put it on the soft tacos and go from there. It was. It's it's sort of funny, like a lot of. You talk to spear fishermen and even just coastal fishermen in general, and they're like, "This fish isn't worth taking." Yeah. You know, this and as a you know someone's grown up sort of freshwater fishing, it's like even those fish are yeah you know, five times better than <laughs> most of the freshwater fish we get. Yeah, you know, 100%. like in terms of like, you know you got a, a naturally brined fish. Yeah, even yeah, it's just yeah thing. I think everything's got a time and a place and every fish has its perfect recipe and preparation and, mm. yeah. Um, i got a good crack with some of your rubs. Um, I've used them in two instances now. Uh, one was with a the, with the smoke batch I did. Um, I had a little bit of a play and I quite liked it. I used your small game uh, crustacean one, I believe. 
Yep, yeah. So that's the Salt Bay rub. Okay. Yep. 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 That worked. Yep. That worked an absolute treat. And then Daniel Mann and I used a couple. We were doing a live cooking show at Adreno Brisbane, the, the Wool and Gabba store, and we used out another couple. I mean, I think you saw that that vid and you saw us. Yeah, yeah, I did did see that. Yeah, yeah, mate, they go good. They're great. Like you got these nicely sort of hand, handmade um, seasoning packets, so they're perfect for what we want. Like, um, I don't know how much do you get at like. Give us a different size. Like, okay, give us an overview of the different rubs you've got, and then the sizes they come in, and sort of how many, how much you use, sort of on an average dish, if you can. Yeah, righto. So. Uh, we do 50 and 100 gram packs mm. and just as I'll just hold them up for anyone watching. This is the 50 gram pack here. And that's the 100 gram pack. Yep. Um, I think roughly it depends on what sort of fish you're doing, but you'd probably get at least three good. So you'd be able to coat three, three good sort of whole decent fish. size fish with the small one. With like a 50 gram packet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what so, I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And like when, and I, when I do smoking, I use brown sugar and then I'll use, um, you know, at least a couple of tablespoons of salt normally. Um, yeah. So I'll probably go like, um, it'd probably be four tablespoons of brown sugar to one tablespoon of salt. Yeah. And that will do probably yep. my whole smoker. I used to use heaps more sugar and salt when I started and I've got less and less and less. And now it's probably nice, but I'm still doing a dry brine. I'm not doing a wet brine. James Sacker taught me how to do this cracker wet brine that he does, but I tried it and I just didn't get it right. So now I've gone back to just the hot, dirty, fast smoke. And it's like yeah, five, five, four or five tablespoons of brown sugar and then one tablespoon of salt. I think you can just as easily exchange it for your salt bay and it's tastier and it's better. Um, and yeah. it gives it a nice, unique sort of flavor, I think. Whereas just your normal salt, um, I mean, it work, works, does the job. Um, does exactly what you want it to, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've actually found a similar thing to you and because I was wet brining for a while just because that's how, if you look up online how to smoke a trout, that's how you find everything. It's, yeah. you know, four tablespoons of brown sugar. And I think they normally say like four tablespoons of salt. Oh, and I found that was way too way much, too much yeah. salt. So I dialed that back to four and two. Yep. And I think the last trout I smoked, I did four tablespoons brown sugar, one tablespoon of salt, but then I threw in a tablespoon of that salt bay rub oh, yeah, nice. into the wet brine. And that actually they actually made that fish come out really good. So because trout's a freshwater fish too, like it's not you that's probably why you want more salt as well to introduce it. But with saltwater fish, yeah. maybe you need less. I'm not sure. Yeah, there's prob- there's probably something in that as well, but um, yeah, even with even with the trout, I find that two two tablespoons is absolutely plenty. So yeah, righto. Yeah, cool. Yeah, but I've I've sort of gone down that same track of you of um, I'm actually starting to prefer the dry brine. Mm. So I think I trying to think if I've put it in a video yet or if it's in footage I've taken and I haven't uploaded yet because I've got a lot of that. I'm about a year behind on the Honky Outdoors episodes at this point. So, um, what? yeah, but the last sort of – I did a trout and I had a tailor and I did them side by side and I sort of took, you know, a fillet from each dry brine mm. and a fillet from each wet brine and taste test them next to each other and – the one I just coated with Salt Bay and then smoked was better on both of them. So yeah, nice. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so you got the Salt Bay, which is perfect for most marine species. What else have you got in the um, thing? You've got you got large game because you do a lot of deer hunting as well, don't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So I've also got um, the squealer rub, which is what you would put on pork, chicken, rabbit, different sort of white meats like that. Uh, and then also have the double shot, which is your venison, beef, large game, things like goats. Yeah, it's hard to say I have a favourite because it just depends on what type of animal or fish I'm eating mm. as to, you know, what I'm going to put on it. And these are sort of... Have you got a pack where you can buy all three rubs? Because it seems like they cover the gamut, those three different um, rubs you've got. They cover everything. Yeah, so that is sort of the idea of it. I don't have a pack as such, 
at this point, but maybe by the time this podcast goes live, so I'll I'll have an option there on the website where you can buy three and get a slightly sweeter deal on it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. I, I um yeah, I haven't used some of the ones you've got yet, but they're sitting out and I've got a cupboard out by my barbecue and smoker and when I have the time and the leisure, I'm definitely going to do it. Lately, I've been, um, I don't know if it's being on a single income budget with the family as well, but it tends to make you a lot more creative and inventive. Uh, at the moment, I'm entertaining the idea of homebrew beer and sourdough um, bread as well and starting to entertain the idea, but seems I've inspired my wife with some of the YouTube videos I was watching because she started making uh, homemade bread as well, so it's been great. But um I think when you become a dad, all of the stuff when you were young, you were like, oh, that's lame. All of a sudden you start going like, oh, that'd be cool, you know, like because it's, it's yeah, I yeah. don't know, like some people say, oh, like spearfishing is the most expensive way to catch free fish. But um, sometimes when you get home and you go to cook it, you're like pretty stoked when you don't have to spend a lot of money and you can produce like, you know, what a, a Michelin star um, chef would produce, you know. Or, or, or our version of it, you know, yeah, what I mean? a yeah. stripped down, yeah, definitely. you know, basic caveman Spiro version of it anyway. Yeah, like the Stephen Ranella scavenger's guide, the Horte Cuisine yeah. style fish. Yeah. 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 And I, I think your rubs yeah, are, um, are in keeping with that. It's like stuff to make you feel like you're a good cook and it's not actually that hard to use and it, and it does add like a touch of class to what you're doing with your wild game or fish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, that was, that was sort of a lot of the thing because I'd sort of been tinkering around making my own spices for probably around four years now. And I sort of had the rough three that I sort of kept sort of coming back to, probably perfected them about two years ago. Because I do have that bit of an entrepreneurial thing, I've always been selling one thing or another, whether it was like, you know, flies for fly fishing or different bits and pieces like that. And I sort of sat in the idea and I sort of kept talking to her about it. She's like, oh, I don't know. And I was sort of going, oh, I'm thinking I'm going to do it. And then uh, last year I had a change of jobs mm. and I actually had a job lined up that was going to start in about a month's time. And so I had four weeks at home and I went, you know what, I've got gotten this big payout from – you know, all my annual leave I had saved up, long service leave. I said, I'm going to have a crack at doing these rubs. I'm going to – and she said, well, don't go too crazy, you know. I'm like, yeah, right, that's fine. I said, I'll just – I'll start out. I'll buy like, you know, 20 of each of these size packets. I'll get some labels printed from a mate in town that does all the labelling for me. And I think at the start I would just – I think I just bought spices from like Woolworths, so like small quality quantity stuff, mixed those up and yeah, and they were they were a big hit. We sort of test them out in family and they're like, yeah. And then I po- posted up on Instagram, like got these, sold out the first batch like straight away pretty much. Oh, beautiful. So, and then Sarah's like, yeah, okay, like you can have a crack at it now. So then I ordered like twenty something kilos of you know like bulk spices. So I've had these massive boxes show up at home with just you know like kilos of paprika, kilos <laughs> of all this stuff, <laughs> and then have another box show up with you know all these packets. And yeah, it just it's just been it's been pretty steady ever since then. We just yeah, I'll often have to make just because I do work full time as well. It's obviously not sustaining itself yeah what do you do for a crust along with your side hustle yeah so um i'm a surveyor i actually have been studying through university of southern queensland for the last seven and a half years and i've just graduated like a week ago congratulations brother that's awesome yeah but um and it's sort of uh i have a habit of doing this it's sort of i've finished that degree now and pretty much as soon as i've finished it the large civil construction company I work for now when I know, you, you know, you've done your surveying degree and you, you're a great surveyor, but do you want to step up and start doing this project management slash project engineering role and sort of have thought about it and went, oh, you know, I don't know, but yeah, I've sort of jumped across and stepping up to that role in the new year. So Far out, mate. You're a busy yeah. man. 
and obviously talented yeah. too, which is why you're getting promoted and good opportunities. So as well as doing that, you're doing honky outdoors and you're a dad and a hunter and a forager and a, and a spiro. Yeah, yeah, not as much of a hunter, a fisher, and spiro as I'd like a to part be. Time, but, um, a part time fun yeah, guy. Yeah, part, part time, <laughs> but, you know, it sort of feels like full time. And over the, I've sort of had a, a pretty good job to go work on up in the New England high country at the moment. Yeah. And so I'll be up there at least once a week for a couple of days. And so I've just been sort of leaving a fly rod in a car and go chase some trout or oh. silver perch after work, which is, I've been, I don't think I haven't been fishing every week for the last, you know, month and a bit. So it's been, been pretty good. The good thing about being a sort of a generalist um, outdoorsman, if you want to call it that, is that, you know, if you're close by the ocean, you can go spear. And if you're up in the mountains, you can take a bow or a fly rod or, whatever I, I, there's something about that a bit of a renaissance man like you just sort of getting amongst it and having a crack as and where you can got a sweet deal for you today guys go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from adam stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines there's frenzel advanced frenzel and hands-free equalization mouthful deep frenzel equalization bifinning essentials these are courses that will give you the one percent that will allow you to improve Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Check that out at audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Hey, Shrek, holy smokes, my big green friend. You guys have been smashing it over there. Every episode of the Noob Spiro podcast is full of actionable spearfishing info. It's exciting times, and I'm stoked that so many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at SpearingMagazine.com. Just wanted to say that noobers can get an international subscription at SpearingMagazine.com right here at SpearingMagazine.com. Thank you, my friend. Are you following at Old Man Blue Dive on Instagram yet? Bert Calder, creator of the Old Man Blue Dive gear, is an absolute legend. They're people that froth on the spearing life and intentionally make super hard wearing and practical gear that will stand the test of time. Visit oldmanblue.com.au and check out a bunch of tough, robust equipment made by people that are just as passionate about spearing as you are. oldmanblue.com.au One thing I was thinking about, you know, when you're talking through some of these things you do, and and I I don't know if if you've experienced this, but for me, like when I learn something, Sometimes you watch someone really experienced do something or teach something and they've forgotten all the basic obstacles that you encounter when you get started and they think it's that self-evident that they don't even worry about teaching you. And yeah. like I've had a few people have me on, particularly in the early days of spearing, like, oh, you know, like why have you got a, you know, like a spearfishing podcast? You know, you've only been spearing for three or four years or whatever. And I was kind of like, well, I'm not like professing to be some guru. I'm just a guy that's having a crack and learning as I go and sharing those lessons I'm learning as I go. And I want to learn from yeah. others. And But when I when I smoked fish for the first time, I did it wrong. And then the second time I did it wrong as well. And I think the third time I did it, I made a video because I was like, oh, well, I'll just teach what I know, which is still bugger all, but it's more than a lot of people know because I've done it three times. But you're still in that sweet spot where you've just learned something and it's a good place to learn something. Same thing with GoPros. Like first time I picked up a GoPro, I knew nothing about it. I had heard a bunch of things from people on the podcast but really didn't know much about it. So I got on, watched, you know, did an hour or two hours research as you do and then I learned about it, got all the bits and pieces and then I made a video about what I'd learned. And some people will say yeah. like, you know, you, you get criticism from people that are – sometimes at the other end of the spectrum where they may have spent, you know, 10 years of their life geeking out on this one thing and they, they think that you need to have 10,000 hours on that one thing before you are allowed to teach other people about it. Or like I call these people like the, gate, the gatekeepers, the self-professed gatekeepers yes, yes, or the, yes. the arbiters of truth. And I think sometimes it's ridiculous because there's no one to help connect the dots from where people are now to where you are, you know, and so – but you, sometimes you get a little bit of push down from that. You get a little bit of, I don't know. Have you experienced that? I've absolutely experienced that in 
every aspect of stuff I've done, I think, ever. So, yeah, so with that whole gatekeeper thing, um, there's a podcast called Becoming a Bowhunter Podcast. Okay. And I've listened to a few episodes of it and it's pretty well done. And the guy that runs that is literally a brand new bow hunter. Okay. He's someone that's gone, I'm going to get into bow hunting. I want to learn how to do this. And so pretty much as soon as he's gotten into it, he started up this podcast and then he's gone ahead and started interviewing people that are obviously 10 years down the track that want to have a chat to him. So he's sort of learning on his own, but at the same time calling on the knowledge of all these older guys that, mm. you know, would be what these other gate people, gatekeeper people call you know, experienced enough and the ones that they would want to see do a podcast. But, you know, a lot of those guys don't have the time and, you know, they've forgotten more than they know. You know, like yeah. it's, yeah. So, but his podcast is good from that aspect because when you, when I want to get into something or know more about it, I'll go seek out this information. And if there's no information for actual beginners in there, it's sort of just a wash of, jargon yeah. a lot of the time yeah. and so you find yourself lost in it and not actually learning much from it but like you said sometimes it's that person that's just learn about it is the best sometimes the best person to learn off because they know how to translate it back in the layman's terms for you to understand and it makes it easier to pick up and i've even had you know people comment youtube videos or send me messages on instagram about spear fishing and i go look i don't know heaps but this was what I did when I started out, and then I'll generally just point him straight towards your podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, well, like I mean, two hundred and something episodes. I mean, it's an easy enough thing to do these days, you know. But I mean, people tune into the podcast now, and I'm as guilty of using jargon and terms like slang as anyone else these days because I've just forgotten and I don't explain stuff for a lay audience anymore. Um, but if they started at the start of the podcast, who are a lot more fresh, hopefully it's a little bit more you know, like come along on that journey with us, yep. you know. But I remember... And just um, just on that note, it just reminded me, when when I started out and I bought that 110 single band gun, mm. I took it out in the shed and I was just having a tinker with it. I, was, I knew not to, you know, load it out of the water. That's sure. never a good idea. Sure so did. don't do that if you're a new sphere and you're listening to this. So but I was just having a bit of a tinker with it and I, you know, pulled the trigger, pulled the shaft out then went to put it back together and went i have no idea how to rig this line back up i have no idea where to put it the shooting line path yeah yeah the shooting line part i had no idea what the deal every spear gun's different i had no idea where it was meant to run i had no idea what it was meant to wrap around how it was meant to be what order it was meant to go in and i looked and looked and looked through youtube and couldn't find a (laughs) single video on it so if you're somewhere out there that's pretty knowledgeable and all that stuff, maybe someone from Adreno is listening. If you could sit down and grab a few guns and show just the basics of how to reload that thing and wrap it up, that'd be fantastic. Oh, mate, <laughs> you're, you're talking my language. Um, but you know, like you've been once you've been sparing for two years, again, it's just something that you like. Ah, oh, it's you know, it's just that's elementary. You know, like you'll figure it out. And some some guys are great at figuring stuff out. Like they just look at something once or twice and then they kind of get the gist of it and they just figure it out. Me personally, like sometimes I'm I'm as I'm as dumb as a post, you know, like I, I want I want like step by step. Like I know, like I don't know if it's just the way my brain works or whatever, but I love it when someone just breaks something down really, really basic. Shooting line pathway is a perfect example of this, by the way, because every spear gun is different. You got closed muzzles, open muzzles, rollers, and all the muzzles are different. And um Duncan Henderson built me a roller years and years ago and it had a fairly complicated shooting line path. But when he explained it to you, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I still forgot it. And I just started rigging the gun the way I liked it. And uh, he's like, oh, why aren't you doing it, you know, the way I showed you? And I was like, because I'm a caveman and this is what I do. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, like um, some people like stuff that are real simple. Like when I reload a gun in the water with um, with shooting line, I want something that's really clear and easy that you can do with big exaggerated movements when you've got um, swollen skin from being in the water for four hours with a big pair of gloves on. Um, I don't want to be yep. making super fine movements and stuff like that, which is why I use the 
I don't, I don't know if you've heard the one of the latest episodes, but Bert um, disparagingly talks about the Durban knot, he calls it, which is... Uh, yes, quick, yes, the Durban knot. Yeah, yeah the, the, the listen quick, to that one. Yeah, 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 but it's sort of the quick release knot that you can wear with a pair of gloves on. Um, having said that, I lost a $100 stainless shaft, so I'm not averse to learning a new way of doing it. But, um, yeah, like sometimes I think with spear guns that's definitely a thing. And um, when you're new, you watch you watch someone new in the water with a spear gun and you're like, holy moly, they're going to shoot someone, you know. And you because it's just like they don't they don't know to check that the shaft's locked into the mech. Um, they actually think that the safety's going to work or have any real utility, and it doesn't. It's not a firearm. The, the safeties on spear guns are just a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. If the bands are pulled back, it's loaded. It doesn't even matter if it's on a loading tab. Don't point it in anyone's yeah. direction because the mech can fail. At it, you know, uh, Spear guns have got a lot more reputable and reliable over the years, but Spearows, again, like we're backyard mechanics, so we might load them up with two bands when – a bit, the spear the spear gun costs ninety dollars and the mech's worth about two dollars and uh, you're loading up too much torque on it and it could go at any time and particularly with the cheap lower end gear that's on the market like you can buy spear guns I think in, you know in some places for like seventy or a hundred bucks they're crap you know you yeah. throw them in a rubbish bin that mech is not safe or reliable and it's a, and the gun's probably going to injure more fish than it's worth but anyway you got me up on yeah. my high horse Ben uh, you reminded me of a whole bunch of stuff that's really important that we don't talk about <laughs> enough so it's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can rant uh, forever. Um, let's get into some hunting stuff. So you're predominantly a shore-based um, Spiro DIY yeah. for the large part. What what are you what what have you learned to do hunting wise to get some results? So you, you you're hunting in pulvers, swell, surge, and you you're not fussy about the fish you're shooting. Walk us through sort of getting in the water and hunting something. Uh, so the biggest thing. I've learned and I always forget as soon as I jump back in the water is pretty much just to slow down and relax. Sort of I'll often get in there and go, I can't see anything. Where are the fish? It's murky and I'll be kicking along at 100 miles an hour and then all of a sudden you'll see a good fish take off from right in front of you. You're like, if I'd have just slowed down and been a little bit ready, uh, you know, I might have had a better opportunity on that fish. And it probably comes back to like the actual hunting side of it. Like, you know, when, you know, if you're hunting like a fairly open, like paddock type country, and that's the same as probably a good viz day. You've got a lot of visibility. You can see ahead and you can play and you can probably see a deer sitting over the other side of the hill. And you know you can sort of take a path around and get in a position for a shot. And it's probably the same when you look down and you can see a good fish and you go, right, I've got time to set up here get a bit of a plan and go for it. And you can move a little bit quicker. But then those murky days are like when you're hunting in a really thick foresty section where you don't have the luxury of being out of the glass out a couple of hundred metres in front of you. You've sort of just got to find some sign, take your time, slow down and just take your time because that you know that when you see something, it's probably going to be in shooting range. And I think that's the same on those those sort of murky days is just to slow down, keep your body language pretty neutral and, yeah. And away you go. So when you're calm, the fish will remain calm and you might get within range. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I often find that, like, when I'm panicking or going, oh, I've got to quickly get a shot in this fish, the fish is already bailing. and But then when I can eventually go, look, you've already missed the last two, you know, shots you've thrown at the fish trying to swim away so just relax and I find when I just sort of slow down get my breathing sort of pretty centered and slowed right down my hand just sort of reflexively will follow a fish and you just feel it just feels good and you probably know feeling well like you know when everything's in sync you're in sync with the tide you're in sync with the swell you're in sync with everything and when you just pull the trigger you're probably actually making some corrections for you know current whatever but it's all subconscious and everything just feels right and you pull that trigger and you see the fish spin around the end of the shaft and it's, it's happy days from then so. <laughs> mate love it i i really like the way you sort of explain that sometimes spearfishing is so much a subconscious activity like yeah your body's doing things when you are in sync and you're relaxed it makes sense 
I like it. It's a good yeah. it's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um what about scary stuff in the water? Have you had um have you had any near misses or stuff that's made you do things differently? Um I haven't had any scary experiences in terms of what like some of these other guys you've had in the podcast talked about being like, you know, bumps with great whites and bull sharks and things like that. I haven't had any of that. I've had a I've been spooked a couple of times by, you know, going down to look under a ledge for a cray and being face to face with a wobby gong. But, you know, that's you know, a small fry challenges to the, the coast, I think. So nothing too scary. I think scary is with probably that day I was with Aaron Kiggins and, you know, we were diving down and just nothing felt right. I couldn't even get my left ear to equalise when because he found some craze down under a ledge and I dived down to have a look and I just couldn't get my left ear to equalise properly. And and not long after that, I just started, I just had a bit of a spew in the water and I think I was just dehydrated from work all day and, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't ideal conditions and it had a bit of a leg cramp. So And we did have a bit of a swim back in from where we were, but it wasn't that bad. And probably the next scariest thing to that was I was with um, – Rob from the Blonde Nomads. They're like a social media influencers okay. on Instagram. They got a fairly big following, but Rob's a, a pretty keen Spiro outdoorsman. And I teed up with him to go for a spear on the previous trip. I was down there and we were getting some abalones off this bombie. He was showing me how it's done. And we're sort of getting like you'd be facing one direction and the swell would make you face 180 degrees and then it'd come back in and you'd be facing 180 degrees while you're trying to pry this abalone off the rock. Yep. And it was great fun until this massive crack of lightning went just offshore oh, like, out mommy. from us and we couldn't have got out of the water quick <laughs> enough. We're like, yeah, we're done. We're getting out of here. <laughs> I I heard that um the, the salt and salt water um, – is non-conductive like it's almost like it will it will stop electricity you know like it and it will restrict it restrict it to a certain area have you heard anything like that i have heard that and mind you we didn't feel anything while we were in the water but i didn't want to hang around longer to nah. find out what happens when it gets closer yeah. so fair enough yeah jeepers that'd be scary all right yeah that that surge diving and swell is a it's a it's a you know like being in a washing machine, and it does take some getting used to. It is literally like being in a washing machine. It's just the fact of like you know you face them one way and then you face the other way. And there's mm. no amount of kicking's ever gonna get you to stay where you are and mm. fix where you are. And you're sort of scrapping on to kanji and whatever you can, trying to not lose where the spot where the abalone was. So yeah, <laughs> I had two things to ask you about. One of them was hydration, um, aqualite. Uh, now sponsor the podcast. Um, th- that stuff is fantastic, but I've been spruiking it for, I don't know, a hundred episodes at least. I've been on the stuff. Um, recently, one of the blokes that work there, Ben, has uh, helped me arrange a deal uh, for listeners and stuff like that. Um, but that that stuff, hundred percent helps with cramp, particularly like those prolonged trips. When you when your ears start um, not equalizing, that's a great sign that you're not hydrated. Uh, water does a certain job to a level, but you're urinating that much when you're in the water for a long time. Like It's hard to stay hydrated anyway, particularly if you start in a yeah. dehydrated state like you, like it sounds like you were. Cramp is another massive indicator that you're dehydrated. What, what, have you changed the way that you make sure you're hydrated before you dive now? Yes, yeah, so I always pack like electrolyte drinks, whether it's just um, Gatorade or something I grab from a service station on the way now, but always make sure I've just got that little bit of extra. Mm. Something there's actually um, a mate of mine runs a company called Atlas Wild. And they do sort of like supplements aimed at mainly hunters, but they've got a few sort of electrolyte replacement supplements as well. Yeah, nice. Um, so I've given those a crack before dives, and they've been pretty good as well. Yeah, but I've been meaning to try it, this Aqualite one. I've mm. been hearing you talk about it. So yeah, oh, they're great. Yeah. I, I buy them a box at a time now, so it's just like. Like when I was out on the Eastern Voyager last time, I think I dived six days straight and I would have, because you did two sessions a day, so you would dive like seven till 12 and then you would dive one till five. 
And uh, and I would try and be in the water every single minute of the day that I could because that's the way I like to go spearfishing. Yeah. So for me, being a guy that's not incredibly fit and wanting to stay hydrated, I would punish one in the morning with a multivitamin and then I'd have another one before I'd head out in the afternoon. I don't actually know that it's that help healthy for you if you do have it that much. But having said that, I didn't deal with cramp or um, air issues. So I just dived the whole trip like I was 20 years old and I'm definitely not. So... Yeah, oh, awesome. Yeah. That's that's some good feedback on it, I guess. And I think I have read on the back of a few of them, like, you know, don't take this for more than yeah. so many yeah, days there's... straight or something like that. Yeah. So I think your kidneys yeah. and your liver, uh, I think from memory, they your organs that help with that and uh, processing it all, and I think it's not that great for you, to be honest. But, um, yeah, uh, but that's if you're you know, hectically overdoing it. But if, you, if you're properly dehydrated, that's definitely the time for that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I got boys and they play soccer games and they think they need two litres of Gatorade to play a game of soccer. And I'm just like, well, you probably don't. You're 12 years old, so <laughs> you just have some water yeah. and that'll do you. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. I think sometimes we're all guilty of that. Um, but, yeah, so so that was a big lesson learned. Um, are you still diving with the bloke off the YouTube channel? Oh, the Blonde Nomads. Oh, blonde yeah, nomads. I, haven't, I haven't been out for a dive with him since. Mm. Um, last time I was down his way, he was off on a caravanning trip up the coast somewhere. So mm. sort of hard to catch up with him. He's sort of in popular, but popular demand. But um, yeah, I always sort of try and reach out to him when I'm heading down that way now because he's a pretty good dive buddy in general. He sort of keep an eye on you and show you what to look for. And yeah. Yeah, nice, nice. Okay, so um, walk us through probably – you know, like your have you had a mentor at all um, with your spearing? Have you have you had any? Um, it sounds like you've sort of pieced together a whole bunch of dive buddies and learned a little bit off everyone. You've had the podcast in the background. What's been some of the biggest resources you've had for it? Paul? Um, some of the biggest resources I've had um, it's probably Sam Clothier, like from Wet Mammal. When I was starting out, his inbox was getting smashed by my new questions a lot. <laughs> and you know what? He's a top bloke and he was just like straight up yep. helpful. He was like, yep. It's like if you want to chase for this fish, you want to look for this ground, you know, don't overdo it. You know, just he gave me some good advice on because I think I was doing some static breath hold stuff like at home in the lounge room. He's like, you know, just, just relax. Don't worry about that stuff too much. It's just... You know, it's good, but it's not It's not the be-all, end-all. Mm. And um, so I've had him. I've had um, Alex Sering, which I think he might be involved with the San Susi Dolphins Club. Okay. He's got a page on Instagram called the Wild Food Meister, and he takes people on, like, guided oh, hunting trips and I've things. I've heard now. about this guy. Someone's actually asked me to get him on the podcast. Yeah, so because I think he has another Insta called the Hairy Spiro. And so, yeah, he was helpful for a lot of stuff. Um, and then there's another guy from down Sydney called Julian Chan, and he he answered heaps of my noob questions as well and was, you know, more than happy to help out. So, okay, yeah, and then um, also Aaron Kiggins has been a good help and even just that diet, day diving with him when I was dehydrated and cramping and vomiting into water, he was nothing but, you know, helpful and learned a lot from him as well. Awesome. And um, and Uncle Mott. Yep. So Mott yeah, Reed. Mott Reed. He, yeah. he actually um, edited the Kickstarter video for 99 Spare Recipes. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I messaged him because he lives in Newcastle and – haven't actually managed to tee up. We've been meaning to do it for a while, but haven't got there yet. But um, yeah, yeah. He, I asked him about abalone before I went. The day I finally got one, and yeah, he sent me a video like, "This is what you're looking for. This is the types of areas you'll find them, and this is how you remove them from the rock without killing them, pretty much." So, yeah, cool. Yeah, massive shout out to him for that. It was super helpful advice. Did he tell you they were hemophiliacs? Yes, yes. Mm, mm. Yeah, bleed out if you stab them. So, yeah. so that's why everyone yeah. uses an abalone tool to just, if you get them up for whatever reason, like particularly like sizing them can be difficult on a rock or under a rock. And then so you pull them out and see it, check if they're size on your gauge. But 
sometimes like um, Old Man Blue's got a tool that's got, it's like a, a it won't um, cut them, but then it'll also, you know, give you a size as well. I think having a tool like that if you're chasing abs is pretty, is pretty critical because other, otherwise you're killing them. And um, they're not an incredibly resilient animal, as we've seen, like, with, um, you know, different parts of the world, abalone fisheries are closing down, you know, like the California blokes. Yeah, like California, yeah. yeah. And that's pretty tragic, you know. You, you'd love to see that fishery recover to the point where, where um, Spiros are back out and getting amongst it again. But, yeah, um, we've got to look after it. And uh, it's good that guys like Mott, Uncle Mott are there to give people like, um, you know, you and me that, that information. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And if I he hadn't have told me that, I would would have had no idea. It would have been just, you know, prying underneath it with an knife and <laughs> hoping for the best. But mm. yeah, it was sort of a good thing he did mention it. But at the same time, I think I can't remember I'll have to go back and double check this, but I think I may have read something in the New South Wales fisheries thing that said you couldn't use a flat tool to collect abalone. Yeah, right. Eh? So I don't know if that's I, whether I've read that wrong or they've changed it since I've read it, but I'll have to go back and double check that. So you just pry them off with your hand? Yeah, he sort of showed me a way where you could with the cilia when the cilia grab is still them from out. one side and you sort of twist a bit yep. and they will let go. Yep. There's a he had a he sent me a video of how to do it. Which ah, cool. Was, yeah, that might be the case there, and that's probably the reason why you can't use a flat tool, even if the tool's designed right. It's because of in the early days people were harming them. So that's ah, cool. Yeah, I haven't actually had any uh, New South Wales abalone. I've had it from Victoria, South Australia, and and WA too. But yeah, and New Zealand obviously. But yeah, um, we yeah. we don't get them up here. So it's definitely a temperate water or um, sort of southern. Yeah, that's so that that's cooler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Oh, good. Um, I, I feel like um, we could we could talk about bow hunting and hunting and foraging and its parallels to spearfishing. Um, I wanted to ask you briefly about foraging, coastal foraging. Have you done much of that, being three hours inland? Uh, yeah, I have done a little bit of it. Okay. I've been meant to do a lot more. Um, anyone that's familiar with the Honky Outdoors brand will probably know we've got a set of 12 foraging cards mm. that are designed at um, sort of species of things you can forage in a pine, like a typical radiata pine forest plantation. Oh, yeah. So that's everything from pine mushrooms, blackberries, native raspberries, bulrush. There's stacks of stuff in there. So you've got um, 12 cards, so it helps people to identify and then understand yeah, the yeah. seasons. The, what, what else do they need to know? What are the, the critical information yeah. you have on the cards? Yeah, so it's got it's got all that information on it, where they typically grow, the season, what areas around Australia you can pretty much find them in, scientific name. Um, I think there's also some common like lookalikes to look out for on there. And we've actually just started, well, we're about 50% way through it. We've got a coastal set of foraging cards. Ah, in the works. cool. Sarah's um, finalised. Yeah, because my wife Sarah does the illustrations for them, she draws them up on a tablet. Yeah, you guys have got some amazing makes illustrations. Them look pretty, so. yeah, I was actually just looking at I was gonna ask you about some of that artwork. If people go to Honky Outdoors on Instagram, it's H O H N K E Outdoors. Um, there's a couple of illustrations like even on your your it, did she do the ones on your rubs and your stuff as well? And then there's I uh, so so on the rubs. I actually did the labelling for those okay. myself. Wow. So the um, little logos you see of, like, you know, the lobster, the pig and the deer, they're, you know, royalty, copyright-free, clip art things oh. I've just modified. Yeah, nice. Um, the logo, I I paid someone to design the logo for me and then the rest of the stuff I just did myself. But, um, yeah, Sarah, like if you have a look at, say, the product like, the um, finishing salt smoked over Banksia pods. Yeah, yeah. There's a little Banksia drawing on that. That's one Sarah's drawn up. Yeah, nice. I'm, and then we've put onto that label. I'm looking at the Honky Outdoors Coastal Australian Nature Cards as well. Is that Sarah? It's got. Yes, so that's nice. Sarah. That's the set we're currently working yeah, on. Cool. Um, so she's done her part. She's got my 12 illustrations of, yeah, sort of common coastal yeah. foraging things to find. Yep. 
everything from mushrooms to sea lettuce and um, I think we've even got banksia pods on there because you can use banksia pods to obviously smoke fish and all your smoking needs and they're free and abundant and everywhere on the ground over the coast. So mm. don't let a good, you know, a good, what do you call it, a good resource like that go to waste. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Love it. Um, uh, yeah, so she's just waiting on me to write up all the little bio information for them and hopefully we'll have those printed and on the website in the new year. I like this idea because you can take kids out. And you can just have a crack with your kids. And obviously, like, you're a dad as well. So, I mean, that's kind of how you guys, I guess, imagine this product. It's like, you, you know, like it's like a treasure hunt for kids. And you they can learn yes. about their natural environment and then just get amongst it, have a crack at it, and then you can eat the fruits of your labor. So it's kind of like a, a fun thing you can do with your family. Yeah, that is 100% the reason behind that product. Sarah had actually... Because our son, James, he's the only one at school age yet. He's seven and so he's homeschooled and Sarah had come across a resource and it was pretty much like, say, a treasure hunt thing for, you know, stuff to find in a pine forest. But it was a North American-based thing mm. and it was just like, it wasn't as detailed as our cards. It just had like an illustration and a name. like So it had pine cone drawing and then just pine cone written under it and kids had to go out and find it. But... When I had a look through them, I said, oh, look, you can't even, like most of these species of mushrooms that are on these cards aren't even present in Australia. Yeah. And I said, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if we had, you know, a set of cards that were more localised and specific? And I said, but I don't really know anyone that could draw them. And so I went, I could draw them. I'm like, <laughs> oh, you reckon? And she's like, yep, yeah, give me a crack. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, she stepped up and did that and oh, that was the story of those. And they're also um, printed on like a waterproof card material. Yeah, nice. Because Kid proof. Yeah, most of these places are pretty messy and yeah. kids are messy. And so you can dunk these thing in a muddy puddle and just clean them up, rinse them off fresh water and they're fine. So. Love it, love it. Oh, that's cool. Mate, that's a, that's a great idea. I love it. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone or Android phone. Get amongst it, noobspiro.com forward slash audible, free trial, free book, no brainer. That's noobspiro.com forward slash audible. In the world of free dive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash TED with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. I keep thinking of questions I want to ask you and then we keep talking and I'm, I'm forgetting them, which is, <laughs> which is not like the professional Shrek interview that I'm supposed to be. Um, mate, that's cool. I love it. Um, what about funny stuff? Um, you, you're out spearing with random people all the time have you had anything embarrassing happen to you i haven't i haven't been in the water or around enough people to have any poo stories oh, for me yet. Ah, um, unfortunately most people i go with it's either like a quick afternoon dive or you know they're just you know know how to hold it in so i don't have any poo stories for you but um Trying to think if I even have a funny story for you at all to do with spear, and it's sort of, um, yeah, I might have dropped the ball on this one. You're right, brother. I, I was thinking when you were talking about foraging, um, 
One of my favourite movies and actually favourite books as well was um, Into the Wild. Have you ever seen that or read the book? So I think I it's, know, John, I it's John Krakauer. He's, um, he recreated this book uh, on, a, on the story of a guy, Christopher McCandless, I think his name was, and um, he used the alias Alexander Supertrank in, the, in, the, in his life. Um, I'll, I'll probably give away that I don't want to give you a spoiler, but basically like um, he's 18 about to make the transition into university. He's got a bunch of money in his account to pay for um, university and stuff and money he saved up. He donates it all to Oxfam, cuts up all of his ID and bank cards and everything, burns it in a fire, drives off into the middle of the Mojave desert and then takes off into the wild. And he just lives as a, uh, as a tramp, um, just sort of getting around America and he ends up uh, in Alaska and um, there's a foraging lesson there at the end because he he takes a book into the wilderness, but Alaska's like the proper wilderness. Like, and yeah, um, yeah anyway, that's kind of the premise of the book. It sort of follows um, a year of his life after he you know does this crazy thing, and it's a very very well made movie and a great book and fairly close to the truth. Although as usual, some liberties were taken, I'm sure. But yeah, um, but you you might enjoy that, and I think. Yeah, it, yeah, it sounds like it's right up my alley. Yeah, I'll, um, yeah, it's, I'll have to have a look into it. Yeah, yeah. There's a foraging lesson in there too at the end. I like the idea that you guys had on the foraging cards where you have, um, uh, you know, like things that are a close copy that can be, you know, toxic or poisonous because um, that does happen in the wild as well. And it's like when you're foraging, you really don't want to learn some of these lessons the hard way. So it's cool that you guys are kind of covering off those bases because I think – um, it, it, it's not a straight DIY thing. You need some sort of learning resource, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, it's been a lot of years of myself sort of getting out and about and watching how, you know, the mycologists in some of the groups I'm in will give an identification on a mushroom and something that, you know, people look at and go, I'm pretty sure this is this. And then you'll look at it and go, oh, yeah, I reckon that could be that. And then you have a proper experienced mycologist jump on there and go, no, that's this and this is why. And you go, oh, I completely missed that little little tiny detail on like the edge of it that differentiates it from the edible species. And it's just, yeah, it's um, it's one of those things. There's, there's some safe species you can find. Like in the pine forest, you're pretty good because you know the edible species grow with those pines and the inedible ones are fairly easy to differentiate from the edible ones. So that's sort of a safe environment to kick off a foraging career before just heading out into a paddock and picking up whatever you find. So (laughs) yeah. End up with some magic mushrooms instead. Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, All right. Cool, man. If you're lucky. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. eh? Like there's toadstools as well and all sorts of stuff. So. Yeah, if I if only some sometimes it's if you only had enough time, but you got to make time for these things. Let's head on out with a, a faster paced round of questions. The Spiro Q and A. Um, what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given? Just to slow down, just to relax. That's that's my tip. What current challenge do you face with your spirit, and how are you approaching it? Uh, my my current one is probably just getting to the water. <laughs> but um, we're looking at taking a trip to around the Coffs region in the coming weeks. So hopefully get back in the water. But the biggest thing that's holding me back is um, equalising. So I'm just trying to watch as many YouTube videos as I can, learn better ways to equalise so that way I can hopefully start hunting a little bit deeper water. Did you watch the Adam Stern video under the MRI? No, I haven't watched that. Go and have a look at that because it teaches you the physiological mechanisms. And then there's a couple of free guides on the internet. Uh, there's a guy, I think, out of Egypt. It's called the Frenzel Fatah, F-A-T-A-H. That's a really long, hard technical guide about Frenzel equalizing and stuff. And uh, it's it's free. This is my point. It's a free resource if you want to have a look at something. Otherwise, I, of course, recommend Ted Hardy's um, – uh, guide to um, equalizing and Adam Stern stuff as well. I mean, I've got discount codes for all of that. So if you go to today's show notes, anyone can grab that. Noobspirit.com forward slash honky, H-O-H-N-K-E. So that way people remember your last name, Ben. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> who is the best person to go spearfishing with for you and why? Um, the best person I've probably been diving with is probably Aaron Kiggins. Like, he was great to follow around the water and even in like that horrible veers. And, you know, he still came up with, you know, two <laughs> decent sized fish. We even found an abalone. It was undersized, so which we just measured it in situ where it was sitting on the rock and moved on. And yeah. And then also um he found like a little ledge under this lobster weed that had was full of little lobsters and yeah, cool. you know, him showing me that. It was a place I would have swam straight over. So just being in the water with him for an hour has taught me heaps. It just makes such a difference going with those experienced guys that I think he's used to diving in Sydney Harbour, so crap viz anyway, and he always managed to come out with hockeys and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, I think just leaning on that knowledge of people that hunt those similar areas to what you do, this just makes all the difference. Dream spearfishing destination anywhere in the world? Ooh, it's a tough one. I'd love to... Um, I'd love to go, you know, somewhere somewhere tropical, just dive some reef and shoot some coral trout and all those, you know, those prize table fish and just enjoy being in some clear, non-murky water for a little <laughs> bit. I think that'd be that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, last question, Ben. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one or max two sentences? So spearfishing experience to me is – it's a place where I can completely disconnect from the outside world and become part of an ecosystem. Love it. That's clean too. Well done. Very, very verbose and thoughtful there. Love it. Um, if people want to follow you, Ben, um, you're on YouTube. You've got a cracky YouTube channel there. You've got foraging uh, missions, rabbit hunting, deer hunting. There's family stuff. There's definitely spearfishing in abundance. Um, check it out. It's Honky Outdoors on uh, – you're Honky Outdoors pretty much everywhere. Um, Instagram, uh, yes. your yep. honkyoutdoors.com, the website where people can buy some of the rubs we were talking about, um, Honky Outdoors on YouTube as well. So, Ben, mate, absolute cracker um, chatting with you. Did you have anything to um, to discuss that we didn't touch on today? Um, you probably think about it after the interview, which is what most of my guests do, and then I go, oh, I Yeah, should I? that'll probably be what happens. Hang on, just I'll just throw this out there now, just so I'll just say it out loud to the world so people know what's going on. I am looking at sort of writing a book, and I've already started it, and it's spearfishing-based, um, and the sort of goal of this book will be – and this topic's sort of going to be around Mulloway, like the Jewfish over here on the East Coast. So if anyone's listening to this and you're somewhere on that New South Wales coastline, you're a bit of an expert at finding these things, um, I'd love to tag along with you for a dive one day. You don't have to give me spots. You can blindfold me to take me there. And I'm not even promising I want to shoot a fish. I'd just like to see one in the water. So if anyone can help with that. I'd um, appreciate you getting in contact with me. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution bar none for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in, and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough. Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar. It's less acidic than other options on the market. It's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just 1% to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to 6 or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you, 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros. 
and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. There was one other thing. Let's... Uh... It's more just a, a fun fact. If um, people have got the 99 Spiro recipes book in their hands, I think the first recipe in mind you come across in there is uh, Stinky Pike Sashimi. And that was a fish, like, every time I've posted that in, like, various food groups or anything like that, people will be like, oh, what are you doing eating Jewfish bait? Or, <laughs> you know, they're disgusting and blah, blah, blah. And I'd sort of come across it just in passing from, Wet Mammals channel, and he'd said these things are great as sashimi. And funnily enough, it ended up being after he said that in his video, I put it on my list for my first day at spearfishing. Going, well, I've seen these fish swimming around when I've snorkeled in spots like this before. So if I can find one, I'll pull the trigger on it and give this sashimi thing a go. And if it's crap, I'll just compost it or something. But <laughs> it ended up turning out to be like really good and. Um, I was just on Instagram the other day and I came across a, just try and find his name, Sushi Chef Hiro. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's got about 725,000 followers on Instagram. Oh, hero. He's probably one of the world's best sushi chefs or if not the world's best sushi chef. Yep. Anyways, he's got a little video there not far down at the moment. Yeah, it's probably only four rows down at the moment. There's a reel of him and he's holding up a plate of three pike on a plate. Okay. So if you need any validation that that <laughs> fish is actually a genuine sushi edible fish, look no further than his Instagram channel. <laughs> I actually follow Sushi Chef Hero on Instagram and he has got some rad stuff. That guy is a sushi artist. Yeah, definitely. This sort of makes my... um. My attempts at it look very Western, I think. So but this is the thing, though, Ben. You, we we roll up our sleeves and we have a crack, you know. Like I had someone disparagingly say, "Oh, seventy two Spiro chefs about you know ninety nine Spiro recipes," and I was like, "Mate, like chef might be some sort of you know official job like trade, but we're all aspiring to be it, and it's great to honour people for having a crack." At a, and having a go and making something of it, you know, like the whole purpose of 99 Spear Recipes is to prov- is to provide, you know, like I, I think of um, cooking seafood like a ladder, you know, and I look at Josh Josh Nillen's books and they're fantastic yeah, for yeah. giving you the ideas and stuff and the big picture stuff, but a lot of his recipes are three or four rungs up the ladder and, there's, and sometimes with those books there's no rungs at the bottom. It, you, you know, you're looking yes. at a ladder and the bottom three rungs are missing and you're like, how do I get there? 99 Spear Recipes is designed to give everyone those bottom three rungs. Your recipes, whether it was the, um, you know, the the burger recipe, like um, the the stinky pike sashimi, there's the whole fish that you did with the brim on the barbecue. Mate, they, yeah, those yeah. recipes are fantastic. That's exactly what I yeah. want to see more of. It's just people making more of their catches and using more of the fish. That's the whole purpose of the book. So, um, yeah. Mate, up them, up them if they're giving you shit for making Yeah, that's it. And I think machine. that comes back to this, that whole gatekeeper mentality yeah, thing you talked 100%. about before. And so people going, oh, well, the only people that should be writing cookbooks is chefs. Yeah. And it's like, but chefs, chefs have forgotten all this stuff that we don't know. We can't get to their level without those first three steps that are missing on the ladder. So I think books like 99 Spirits is fantastic for that because it's that, it's the because, like you said before, the best people sometimes to get the information from are people that have just done it. So it's like I'm not a chef. I actually applied to be a chef out of high school at three or four different places and got didn't even get an interview back for any of them. So, oh, yeah. mate, and we got there, there are <laughs> there are chefs in ninety nine spirit recipes. There's at least three or four proper chefs, if you like, but um. That, that's not really the point of it. They, and these guys have put in recipes and made them actionable for the everyday person, you know, like Harry Foster, you know, multiple master, master chef uh, competitor. I think he came runner up twice. Uh, really talented guy. Uh, Mark LeBroy's in there, you know, Jai Gibbons. There, there are legitimate yeah. chefs in there as well, but all of them get the concept of making seafood actionable and practical for everyday divers. I get home after eight or nine hours in the water. I'm not cooking a Josh Nilland recipe. I love them. I would love to eat it. Don't get me wrong, but I don't have an hour and a half to give it. 
I've got half an hour. This is, I'm going to do my best and try and put a meal on the table in front of my family that they don't turn their noses up at. But apart from that, that's probably the height of my aspirations, you know. So, yep. yeah. But all good, brother. I think that's why I, I, we're kindred spirits. I very much relate to some of your, you know, the the content you produce on your YouTube and your Instagram. You have a crack, you roll your sleeves up. You don't profess to be an expert in everything, but you get amongst it and have a crack. So my hat's off to you and fantastic getting to chat with you and interview you today, Ben. Thank you, Strack. It's been, it's been an honour and a privilege to go from being the noob listening to this to being the noob pre- presenting on it. So thank you. <laughs> all good, brother. Hey guys, I hope you uh, enjoyed that yarn with Ben. Uh, he's a top man. I really, really enjoyed just his, his, uh, his down-to-earth personality and uh, and the lively chat we had. Uh, really a big fan of what he's doing and, and he's got the whole family in on it. Um, I love seeing that sort of stuff. So go to honkyoutdoors.com. That's H-O-H-N-K-E outdoors.com and uh, get yourself some spice rubs for some fish. Throw it on the barbie, lively it up. Uh, some of the some of the stuff he's got going there is pretty special. Hey, next week we're off to chat with the Spiro Hangout Podcast crew. These are the UK spearing nuts. We've got Ben Dunford, Richard Gomez, and Anthony Fraser. These guys all serve aboard uh, the major British Spearfishing Association board. Now they're also heavily involved in their local clubs. They are a really funny bunch of dudes, and I am enjoying listening to their podcast and sort of. Uh, following along with their yarns, it's a really um, they're really into the UK UK specific spearing scene, um, but they're venturing further abroad as well, and uh, it's a good old lively chat. So the Spirit Hangout Podcast crew, if you want to prep yourself for this uh, podcast that will come out, have a listen to their show. So the Spiro Hangout Podcast, um, and download an episode on Spotify wherever you get podcasts. Hey, um, if you love the show. Consider becoming a patron legend. Go to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. I've got 50 legends helping to put fuel in the Noob Spiro outboard. There's always room for more. <laughs> uh, so patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Uh, I hope you're loving the podcast and bearing with all my terrible jokes and verbal faux pas as often as they come. Uh, thanks for all the reviews and love out there on the socials and following us on uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Much love, much appreciation. Um, we're going to keep doing this thing and charging ahead in 2023, interviewing legends from around the planet. That's it for me, Shrek, over and out. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The NoobSpear podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPIRIT, Neptonics.com. Neptonics.com.